Uh, thanks, thanks, Ashok. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Ashok, uh, once again for uh, lovely introduction, and uh, thanks, uh, Sureka, for inviting me to be uh, in part in this program and you know share my views on uh, design thinking. So, <clears throat> I know this is a, so a very short session, and um, so I'm not going to uh, get into a, a you know kind of setting expectations or understanding you know uh, what some of your queries are. So instead, what I'm going to do is to get started with the uh, topic today, and somewhere midway, I'll pause and I'll find out if you have any questions for me, and then uh, you know I'll take uh, from there and start answering those questions. So with that, uh, we will get into the topic about you know design thinking and uh, innovation. And how do we use the concept of design thinking for, uh, you know, not only innovating, but also for solving problems that we face at uh, workplace. And uh, the concept of design thinking has been there for a while now, and it's not a completely new concept. Um, the the I, I would say at least for the last seven, eight years, it's been a buzzword in the market. And uh, a lot of companies have adopted design thinking uh, in India, outside India as well, in bits and pockets. And uh, they have seen success with the concept of uh, design thinking. But that having said, uh, design thinking is more of a, a frame of mind or um, a mindset of how you try to solve a problem. So uh, I think there is no limit to how much we can do on uh, design thinking. So that is the uh, context I want to set for today's session. And I want to bring in a few examples. I uh, did look at the set of participants and it was a mixed group of people from service and from uh, the manufacturing or the core sector. So I would like to bring you know, a few examples from both sides in today's session uh, so as to make it more uh, relevant to you. Uh, we all, uh, you know, when we buy things uh, in the shops, right, uh, today, you know, we have a cashless uh, economy, but still, you know, many of us do have uh, currency in our pocket, physical currency, and we buy things by giving cash, by giving currency notes, right? So, and then we get coins back. And these change or coins, you know, they just accumulate. And I'm sure all of us have something like this in our house where we have accumulated a lot of uh, coins. Um, which, you know, one day we wish to, you know, redeem or we make, uh, you know, in uh, South India, it's common to go and put it into a temple's uh, undil, or sometimes we may go to the bank and, you know, ask them to, you know, take the coins and give us as uh, notes and, and stuff like that, right? So ultimately, uh, when we look at, you know, how much uh, does an individual accumulate coins over a period of time, right? Uh, every week and every month, this was a study done uh, by one of my previous employers, Bank of America in US, and they found that every month on an average, you know, if um, uh, someone was buying stuff, you know, by giving cash by around $4 or so, uh, there were coins accumulating and these coins, when you add it up for a year, it comes to somewhere around $200. So what we in Tamil call as chilrai, right? So this chilrai, uh, you know, gets accumulated into a huge amount. So what Bank of America said is, can we in some manner or the other, put this change or coins or chiller to use for the customer, right? So then they created a program called as Keep the Change program. So what does this Keep the Change program mean? Uh, for example, you buy a coffee for, let's say, $3.67. Or let's say you're buying a coffee in India for, let's say um, 73 rupees 50 paise or something like that right uh, or one idli vada is now nowadays 73 rupees 63 60 paise or something like that right so then you have this 40 paise right which is um, you know kind of a change sometimes that fellow will tender the change sometimes he may not right so if uh, that small value if that value is if you are instead of giving cash let's say you are swiping your card uh, but the card, instead of swi swiping for 72 rupees 60 paise, let's say the card swipes and takes away 73 rupees from you, right? It rounds off the money. But it, now this remaining 40 pies, what will do is the bank will open a savings account in your name and they will put that uh, 40 pies into that saving accounts. So every time you try to swipe your card and buy something, the credit card will, the bank will automatically round off your expense. And the remaining uh, change, it will actually put it into a savings account. Uh, when the bank launched this program, 
they found out that uh, they were able to actually save $3 billion for 12 million customers, which means, you know, a total, uh, you know, savings of $3 million has been created for 12 million people, uh, which is a huge sum, right? So all these small changes getting accumulated kind of, you know, became a big sum. So uh, this is a case study that I wanted to bring in from the context of design thinking. Now, you might be wondering, you know, in the last five minutes, why did Neil take off all of a sudden, uh, you know, and start talking about some, uh, you know, banks example of, you know, how they are helping their customers to save, uh, uh, you know, money from change and stuff like that. And how is this related to design thinking? Uh, it is a problem to solve, right? You have uh, customers and the bank found out that a particular segment of the customers were not opening bank accounts at all. Uh, the what what is called as the baby boomers or the boomer age of mothers uh, they were actually uh, especially single mothers they were hard working uh, ladies but uh, they had very less uh, money left behind for saving for the future of their kids and for themselves so uh, what the bank found out was that if we are able to create a program like this from which we will shave off a little bit of change and put that into a savings account it will be a delighter for the mothers because they would like to save but they didn't have the money to save now this is given an opportunity to save that money so uh, bank of america uh, launched this program and i used to work for them um, and it was a grand success and a lot of banks and it was launched in us a lot of banks uh, have adopted it after that in uh, us and it's a uh, quite a popular program it comes in various names and flavors but if you are a customer of bank of america you would know this by the name keep the change program. Unfortunately, I don't think there are any such uh, programs uh, in India. Now, if you take this particular problem, we could solve this problem using a DMAC approach, which is the Six Sigma's define, measure, analyze, improve and control or TQM's PDCA, or we could use the 8D approach, which is now very popular of late uh, in the automotive sector. We could use lean, we could use just do it, you know, J JDI, or we could use come agile and all that stuff, right? So sometimes we can even use a common sense, the logic of, you know, trying to solve a problem for the customer and, uh, you know, kind of derive the solution. But instead of using all this method, Bank of America chose to use a design thinking framework. And why did they do that? Why do we need another problem solving framework or an innovation framework. We have a lot of frameworks, right? So there are so many other frameworks, so many methodologies are there. Why do we need one more? What is unique about uh, design thinking? And uh, how is it relevant in today's context? If you look at the world today, the, we are living in a VUCA world. I'm sure you have heard of it, right? Uh, we are living in a VUCA world where there is a lot of uh, uncertainty, vulnerability and uh, you know, we are not sure about what happens next month, next week. Uh, Chennai just came out of um, a bad, uh, you know, natural catastrophe. Now we are seeing the same getting replicated in the southern parts of Tamil Nadu. So sometimes it is natural disaster. So sometimes it is man-made disaster, like, you know, cyber attacks and things like that. So there is a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what the future state will be. And in such scenarios, uh, having a very theoretical and a rigid framework for solving problems uh, can create a constraint because by the time you implement your solution, maybe it is irrelevant in the market. The second aspect is that it could be completely lacking a human touch. It could be very functional in nature, but it may not have an emotional element, right? So what is the key difference between the food that's served uh, in a good five-star hotel versus the food that's served at home by your mother, right? Uh, I don't know in terms of the taste of the food, I'm sure all of you are going to say that my mother's Thair Sadam is much better than maybe a, a seven course meal that is served in a five-star hotel, right? I'm sure all of you are going to say it. Um, and if you guess why, because it's not about merely the taste, it's also about the emotional aspect, right? So. Uh, the bondage and, uh, you know, how much, um, you know, involvement the person has. And, you know, so there is an emotional aspect uh, to everything that we are dealing with. And the functional aspects may get fulfilled by merely using a DMAC approach or by using a PDCA approach. But the emotional aspect, that is to say the human centric way of looking at a problem uh, is not touched by any other methodology. And that's where 
the concept of design thinking comes in. Sometimes when we do a structured problem solving approach in DMAC, we end up with a very narrow pool of solutions. That is, we are not able to bring in anything new. Uh, for example, if we are not able to, um, uh, you know, reduce the customer complaints, uh, then we do some root cause analysis. We finally end up saying that we should uh, improve our training for the frontline staff, or uh, we might say that some of our policies are incorrect and we might need to rewrite the policy. Uh, how much more training can you give to your employees? How much revision can you do to your policy? So what new are we doing in the solution, right? And I'm sure there is a say, saying that you must have heard of that, you know, if we don't try anything new, you would end up getting the same results, right? Uh, so. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, one is about the creativity element, which is there in the solutions that we generate through regular brainstorming approach. And the other is the practicality of the solution. And I think that's very important. Um, a lot of uh, IT solutions that we today implement in our companies, many of them go through the hurdle of adoption. That is, once it's implemented, no one wants to adopt or start using it. There is a resistance from the employees or sometimes the users, if they are customers or business partners, dealers, distributors, right? Uh, they might have resistance using this uh, application. And if you look at it, why? Because, you know, there are practical challenges. If you talk to them, they might talk about few practical nuances of uh, this application. And they might uh, say that these are the reasons why we are not using it. So uh, how can we bridge all these gaps or errors which are there in the existing problem solving approach? So uh, that is one of the reasons why design thinking came into picture. The other is also to um, look at, uh, you know, what kind of problems we should actually pick up and solve in design thinking. Uh, don't assume that design thinking is uh, the way I'm uh, maybe, you know, paraphrasing it in the last few minutes, you might be getting an impression that design thinking is a substitute or an alternate approach uh, to your DMAC or for, for that matter, PDCA, AD approach, et cetera. Um, that's not the intent, right? It complements these tools. Uh, if you look at this grid, you know, we are having problem and solution and there are four scenarios, right? Known problems, known solutions. That is, I know what is a problem, I know what needs to be done. Then what is stopping you from doing it, right? So you need good project management uh, framework uh, and good rigor of execution and your home. Uh, the other scenario is that uh, the problem is known, but the solution is not known. Uh, you know, there is a problem, you know how to define your problem, but you're not in a position to identify what is the app solution for it. And that's when we do our DMAC approach. We try to identify what is the root cause of the problem, identify the root cause and then solve the problem. The other two scenarios, you know, where the problem itself is unknown and solution is known, you know, we are not in a position to articulate what our concern is, but sometimes we assume that this is a solution that we need to put in place, right? Why? Because the problem is not very rigidly, um, you know, casting itself in a particular form. It's changing from time to time. So you're not able to pinpoint exactly, you know, where the problem is or what the problem is. So the problem is manifesting itself in multiple ways, but somehow you have a feeling that that's the solution which will fix this problem. Uh, the other scenario is both the problem and the solutions are unknown. So that's a blind spot for your organization. The problems which are unknown, that is the, uh, you, you're not even able to pinpoint exactly what the problem is, leave alone whether the solutions are known or unknown. Such type of problems are called as complex problems. Uh, and complex problems are where exactly, you know, design thinking comes into play. So complex problems are problems where the cause and effect relationships are not very obvious that we're not able to say, you know, why something is working and why it is not working. Uh, our knowledge is not complete and our knowledge is sometimes contradictory. That is what we are assuming will happen and what finally ends up happening is completely different. For example, we sometimes in HR assume that if we give a good increment this year, the attrition level will be very less. But after giving good increments, the attrition is very high. This is what the IT industry experienced uh, between 21 and 22, right? So um, sometimes many stakeholders, many diverse opinions, contradictory opinions. Uh, now, how do you build a solution where uh, somebody says uh, this has to be maximized and somebody says, no, this has to be minimized? How do you, you know, build a solution which can contradict itself? And uh, sometimes the problems, as I said, are interconnected. You're not able to pinpoint exactly what the problem is. Like, for example, why do we have littering in India? 
uh, we are not able to pinpoint, you know, why we are uh, still littering uh, on the roads, right? Uh, after all the good education that we have, uh, why do we still litter on the roads? The problem is interconnected with several other problems, right? So is surveillance the problem? Is education the problem? Is uh, the availability of dustbins the problem? So the problem in itself is complex to solve. So such problems, problems which are very complex to solve is what is apt for design thinking. Now, uh, I will uh, help you understand what design thinking is with few examples in the next few minutes. By now, I'm assuming you understood why design thinking is needed and how is it different from any of the other problem solving approaches we generally follow. The example of uh, this Bank of America, normally when we write a problem statement in Six Sigma or in any other approach, right? If you're using a seven step QC story approach or if you are using an 8D approach, uh, A3 approach, any framework you're using, we define the problem. And in this case, uh, Bank of America would have uh, written down the problem stating that boomer age mothers were not opening bank accounts. As a result, we are not able to penetrate this particular segment, customer segment. And if we do that, we can get, uh, you know, so much more revenue. So that would have been their problem statement, right? Now, what the concept of design thinking does is it does not stop there. A normal uh, problem solving approach says that this is a good way to define a problem. Now, let's start finding out what are the reasons why these uh, boomer mothers are not opening the accounts. But in uh, design thinking, we try to uh, write down what is called as a POV or point of view statement, which is to say that how do we paraphrase this problem from a different perspective? Uh, so instead of, you know, defining the problem in the earlier method that I said, if we decide, uh, define it, that how do we encourage uh, boomer age mothers to open bank account, right? If you see the statements are very similar, you know, you might be asking how, how different is it? You know, I mean, it's one and the same, right? But if you look at the second statement, the point of view is very different. You know, there are two, three keywords here, which is very important. One is how, you know, how means, you know, what is the solution that we are going to provide, right? And that solution should be backed by the reason which is holding these people from opening the bank account. So the first problem statement gets covered in that. The second is encourage, uh, which is to say that we can only, you know, nudge the customers to do something. So our solution should be smart enough that the customers are able to, uh, you know, find value in it and by themselves come and open bank account. And it should not be something that we thrust on the customers, right? So sometimes today we find that um, there are these antivirus softwares when you uh, buy an, uh, you know, an, some other software and when you install the software in the last step of that uh, installation phase, it will say, do you also want to implement this software along with it, right? So somebody is thrusting something on you uh, so that, you know, you adhere to it, right? We are not looking for something like that, but we are looking for a voluntary solution from the customer's perspective. So the way we define the problem, we rewrite the uh, problem statement, uh, what we call as a POV statement is very, very important in design thinking. If I look at industrial safety, right, this is an example from ITC, uh, ITC's paper division, uh, they had a problem of, you know, safety issues happening in the factory. Now, if you are uh, from the factory or the plant side, uh, you would know what are the typical solutions you would put. You would say that, okay, how many machines do we have? which of the machines do not have safety controls. Let's do a safety audit and identify machines which don't have a double hand operation, machines which don't have automatic, uh, you know, closing and opening and, and stuff like that, right? Then we would put certain audits and adherence. If you are using contract staff, we would put a penalty clause to the contractor that all their staff should be coming with the safety shoes and would be should be coming with a helmet to work and, and stuff like that, right? So this is the normal stuff that organizations do to make sure that the employees are following the safety uh, rules. What in design thinking we try to do is, we don't try to enforce you know, this by using the mechanisms that I talked about. Instead, we write the point of view statement as why workers might make unsafe choices even when they were aware that this could end up hurting them, right? Uh, each of these workers, I'm sure, you know, are aware that if they do something unsafe, it's a challenge. Uh, still, why are they doing it? Uh, a lot of people, we see road rage, right? So people are, you know, ri riding all these uh, fancy bikes, super bikes on the highways at, at um, uh, what phenomenon speed in the night and all that stuff. And we know how the roads are potholes and, you know, uh, how people are sleeping on sometimes the pavement, foot, uh, the footpath and all that. 
so um in spite of knowing that uh, going on a bike at a particular speed you know maybe above 100 or so is risky why do people still take that risk so something like that right so trying to see the problem not by enforcing it by by asking a question as to what is the behavior which is driving the problem or you know why unsafe work conditions are not being actively reported by workers they know it is unsafe for them but why are they not saying that so this is the way in um, so this is a second example of how uh, in design thinking we try to paraphrase or um, we call, we call it the point of view of statements are written in such a way that we try to focus more on the human side of the problem rather than trying to focus on the system side of the problem now, uh, if you look at um, what are the other aspects of design thinking, one design thinking is an action oriented approach. Uh, many times our leaders are restless that, you know, you take a problem, you define the problem and then you go about collecting data, you start analyzing. So sometimes people are saying that uh, how fast can you get it done, right? So people are restless about, you know, implementing a solution. Uh, with design thinking, we don't uh, deliberate a lot about um, you know, what the data is saying. Of course, we use a lot of data, but we don't crunch the data. We don't do statistical hypothesis validation and that kind of stuff, right? So instead, we try to quickly go and find out what's working and what's not working. The second aspect I already mentioned, right? We empathize with the customer. So the empathy or the human aspect is very uh, prominent in design thinking. And the focus is more on gaining the insights. The success of a design thinking initiative, a project, would be measured by how much insight we are able to gain about the customer's behavior, about the behavior of the other stakeholders in the system and the interaction between those stakeholders. So those insights are given more weight rather than the uh, results that we are going to produce in terms of you know, how creative our solution is. And uh, the balance between functional and emotional value. I gave you the example of uh, uh, the food that you take from your home, from your mother's hand versus the best chef in, uh, in Chennai. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all would love to have the food of your mom. So there is a functional aspect of everything and there is an emotional aspect. Even, for example, assume you are getting a reward uh, for best employee in your organization for the year 23. And uh, let's say, you know, the uh, whole ceremony is very functional in nature and um, or it's happening very virtually. And one day you realize on your desk, there is a certificate with some gift pack and uh, with some chocolates and a letter from the CEO stating that congratulations, you got the uh, best employee award and the certificate is just kept on your table. Right. What is the great thrill about it? You anyway are the best employee, but there is no great thrill about, you know, getting the certificate. But on the other hand, if you are call to the stage on the dais and then you are rewarded in front of everyone. Uh, there is an emotional aspect to that uh, reward that you gain, right? So that is the aspect that design thinking focuses on. And uh, one, it is action oriented. Second, it is iterative in nature. So what we try to do is uh, we try to improvise every time uh, as we start uh, doing prototypes or pilots and we try to refine our ideas or concepts so that we know that what's working, what's not working. So what's not working, try to see, you know, why it is not working. Try to, uh, you know, go down deeper to find out, you know, why it is not working. And that can give you uh, some more insight. And as you start refining it, you might realize that, you know, your solution is very perfect in nature. And a good uh, example of this is uh, Amazon's, uh, you know, service. Uh, I'm sure most of you are customers of Amazon's delivery service, right? You go to the uh, Amazon's website and buy stuff and all that thing, right? So how did Amazon start that whole thing? Uh, it started with the e-commerce revolution with the uh, Amazon selling the books and all that stuff. But ultimately, he used what is called as a flywheel, right? I I'm sure you heard of this Amazon's flywheel. So he identified that at every stage as he started uh, growing his business, he realized there are certain needs of the customers. Then there are certain needs of the sellers who are coming to the platform. Then there are certain needs of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, business owners, you know, who are owning the business. So iterative process of trying to understand, you know, what is working for the customers, what is not working for the customers, improvising on that. Uh, for example, return policy was very friendly. Uh, people are not at home to receive the goods. So what should we do? Uh, if uh, the goods are delivered to somebody incorrectly, then what do we do? You need to generate a PIN or OTP. So like that, they kept on uh, improvising it and they started validating it at every stage with the customers. 
the last point is very important because many times what we do is we want to get the perfect solution and then go it go and show it to our boss and our boss also wants to make the solution as perfect as possible and then go and launch it in the market now in this process of trying to make this perfect we consume a lot of time and by the time you know in the wuka world the solution you are trying to provide may not be even relevant right so it's very very important for us to find out how we can quickly go and validate our concept in the market what we call as uh, M, uh, mvp right minimum viable product get a product which has minimum features go and test it in the market and get the feedback from the customers and use that as a uh, pivot to grow more so the design thinking framework in essence uh, uses this kind of a structure and you would see there are multiple other frameworks or structure and that is one good thing about design thinking is that it's a, a pretty flexible uh, structure in itself the first step of design thinking is empathize so we want to empathize with the audience by understanding their pain points uh, then we try to use the empathy and our observation to define what is the problem so point of view statement is created in the defined phase then we generate ideas on you know how can we you know gain more insights about the customer about the pain point that you are talking about how do we know that this definition of the problem we have written down is actually true uh, then we get some ideas from it we try to take one by one filter some ideas take one by one and pilot or prototype those ideas and we try to use the concept of creating rapid prototypes rudimentary prototypes and we validate it with the customers i'll show you some examples in the next uh, couple of minutes and once we validate these examples we will get an opportunity to sometimes even go back again listen to the customers maybe this will help us to redefine our problem and then we will ideate and see how we can refine the solution and finally we launch the product to the customers so this is the uh, broad framework of uh, design thinking which is very different from um, what your uh, six sigma approach or what your 8d approach or even to some extent the dfss approach talks about right where we say that define what the problem is then you try to you know understand all the system requirements then develop the system then uh, you know based on the voice of customer uh, then you know uh, validate it and then launch it so that's the logical step right like a waterfall approach that we use this is a more of an iterative approach that we use in design thinking and uh, you would realize that if you are wanting to learn any new skill let's say uh, if you are very curious about cooking you know sometimes some of us want to learn uh, cooking because some, some of us learn cooking out of pressure uh, if you are a bachelor you know at one point of time you need to learn how to cook to survive right sometimes we want to learn that out of pleasure right so we we say that okay i want to enjoy it it's a hobby for me so we learn a new dish we learn a new um, uh, cuisine uh, altogether for example the north indian way of cooking food or the italian food or the continental and, and stuff like that bakery and and and, and things like that uh, what do we do how do we learn that process so we do something someone teaches us we learn a little bit about it we implement it we find out what's working well or not what's uh, working well then we try to improvise it and in doing so uh, you would realize that sometimes and at least in south indian food or north indian food as you are cooking you will try to sample the food you might even give it to your spouse or to your children or your parents to ask them to taste and say it is good or not is salt is needed it should it be boiled for some more time and stuff like that right so as you start doing this kind of an iterative process you are already starting to use design thinking framework so you should understand that all of us by nature are design thinkers and uh, the concept of design thinking right is like thinking like a designer and what does a designer have on his hand when he starts to uh, you know uh, deliberate on a problem he has nothing other than the problem so a designer has a problem on hand and then um, he has a whiteboard then he has to identify what is the solution for this particular problem of the customer right so then he can look at you know different ways and use the design thinking framework in that process so starting to think like a designer is essentially the spirit of design thinking and many of us by our first nature are design thinkers uh, unknowingly or knowingly we have been practicing design thinking for a very long time so i want to play a video now so uh, maybe by the time i set up the video 
uh, I thought I'll pause and also find out if you guys have any question for me. If you have any question, you can uh, ping that on the chat. Uh, let's take a minute. I know we have passed the uh, halfway limit. So uh, this is a good time to, you know, take some questions and then I can continue. At least I would like to know what questions you have so that I can answer it in the next few minutes. Yeah, you need to be a little louder, please. Uh, I'm audible now. Yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, you actually uh, gave some hint on this Amazon's flywheel. Yeah. Uh, so actually, personally, I'm not aware of it. So any inputs on that, please? That would help. Yeah, if you Google, you will find out. Maybe after the call, um, I will uh, through Sureka, I'll ask her to share uh, some literature on the uh, will Amazon's that, uh, Will that uh, link to this design thinking framework? In some way, yeah. I mean, see, that is what Jeff Bezos has done, right? So he has used indirectly the design thinking framework uh, to develop his business and improvise his business. Fine, if you look at traditionally how some of the big businesses, uh, you know, big business houses in the world have come up. Uh, Walmart, for example, uh, Amazon, for example, uh, even for that matter, uh, Tesla or PayPal. A lot of these kind of companies, you know, which have launched the first of its type product uh, or very innovative product, the, the founder of the company or the prime architect of the company, you know, has been uh, a design thinker by nature. Whether you call it design thinking, uh, that time design thinking existed or not, those are different issues, but they use the framework of design thinking. So uh, in a way, the Amazon flywheel concept imbibes the spirit of design thinking. So I'll share some literature which you can use to learn. Fine. Got it. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, questions? Anybody else? Okay. Let me uh, play a small video now. And uh, after that video, we will continue. South Korea. A country devoid of oil. Are you able to hear the system audio, the audio of the video? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. A city where one fourth of Koreans live with one of the world's highest gasoline consumption. The situation is getting worse. Car usage is increasing. Petroleum costs are rising. Parking spaces are scarce. People are stressed out. Every day, a sole driver wanders 500 meters to find a parking space. In a month, this equals 15 kilometers or one liter of gas. S Oil, one of the four oil companies in Korea, took action. It is on a mission to save oil. Right here, right now. Thus begins the HERE campaign. It has set up a HERE balloon for each parking space. As a car parks in it, the balloon falls. When the car exits, the balloon rises. Cars can spot these balloons from afar. They can spot open parking spaces without wandering. Finding quick parking means saving oil. One easily spotted parking spot is worth one liter of oil saved. Okay, I will uh, stop the video now uh, because I think the main part of the video is completed. <clears throat> so what is your take on the, uh, the particular solution that you saw here? Uh, it's a very simple solution, right? So you had uh, a problem of people spending a lot of time in trying to find out the parking lot. And uh, it's also burning a lot of fuel in the process. So it hurts financially. It also uh, creates a lot of anxiety. Uh, you know, when you have uh, a movie uh, at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon and then you are reaching the uh, mall by 2.15, you are very, uh, even if you are not anxious, your kids are anxious. anxious parking lot will we be able to get it or not get it right uh, if we don't get the parking slot then that you know the chances of we reaching the cinema hall on time is very high so there is a lot of emotional aspect attached to a problem like this so what we try to do in design thinking i'm now moving from the phrase of trying to 
phrase the problem to go to the next level of trying to uh, you know gain insights from the customer and uh, go to the middle of the problem to say what should be the solution which we should be using right and this is what we call as how might be statements or hmv hmw statements right so this how might we statements are nothing but they are statements which are used to reframe our insights uh, that we have gained by observing the customers so traditional problem would have here been that you know there is a lot of fuel wastage and he is also quantified in the video how much fuel was wasted in uh, in searching a lot parking slot and things like that but uh, if we want to rephrase this problem as how might we uh, statement then we will say that how might uh, how might we make searching for empty parking uh, easy for the drivers right or uh, for the drivers easy right whichever way it is so ultimately you see here that uh, the emphasis is now on three important elements uh, one is uh, searching so that is the activity that uh, the customer is really interested in so how can we support the customer in that activity in the activity of searching the empty parking lot then the next is who who is the user the user is the driver and what is the experience that the uh, user is looking for he is looking for easy experience he is not looking for saving cost at the time when you are actually you know in the cinema hall and you are late to the cinema hall you are not worried about the fuel you are more worried about finding the parking lot. If someone says the parking lot is in the seventh floor, you don't mind going all the way to the seventh floor to quickly park your car and go to the moving hall, movie hall. So ultimately, uh, ease of parking is the main problem here. And how did we find this out during the discovery phase? Uh, once we paraphrase the problem, if you go back to this framework, we uh, empathize with the customer, spoke to the customer, understood what the problem is, then uh as we started understanding the problem better as we got insights from the customer we were able to define exactly what is the priority of the customer and this is the priority of the customer so that that will be the starting point for you to generate ideas so this will be the starting point for the third phase which is the ideate phase so this is how a design thinking uh, problem uh, is generally solved I'm, I'm sure by now you appreciate how it is different from a traditional problem solving approach. I want to throw out a few examples before we wrap up the session. And I think that will give you some idea. If you look at, uh, uh, you know, one of the case studies or scenarios, uh, there were uh, kids from a lower income group in uh, a third world country. And uh, one of the challenges was how do we uh, use these kids to use computer to, uh, you know, learn about English language, etc. The challenge was that they had only one computer uh, in the college or in the uh, school and there were multiple students. So uh, there, there were, uh, let's say, you know, 15, 20 students in a class uh, in a kindergarten or maybe in a third standard or fourth standard. Uh, but there's only one computer or PC. So how do we get all the kids to experience the computer, the technology, and at the same time have fun with it, but learn English? There is a productive outcome. So that would have been a how might be statement. Then somebody said, okay, why don't we add multiple mouses to the same computer? So instead of connecting one mouse, you see you are seeing multiple you know, icons here. So somebody has already connected six or seven uh, different uh, mouse to the same computer and they have changed the icon differently. And each team, you know, each team has three or four students and each team has been given a title of zebra or, you know, a bear or a chicken and something like that. So they will play this word building game using a single PC, but multiple mouses. So very simple and innovative solution, right? Like the earlier one that I had shown, we're not uh, going for a high funder stuff that we will use generative AI and we will use some kind of a new technology that's been launched in the market, the VR, Meta, and, and, and stuff like that, right? So we are looking at practical solutions. So if you see here, this is the other side of the video looking at how the students, you know, two, two students are having one mouse in there with them and then they are clicking the mouse and uh, building the words. So very simple and effective solutions is what design thinking provides. Uh, and it's not necessarily about, you know, the, uh, uh, the marketability of the solution, you know, how great the solution is on paper. That's not the important element. It's about, you know, how friendly it is to the users. Uh, another way to prototype or test, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, we look for validation, we look for quick, rapid prototyping and design thinking. 
So a group of uh, college students from MIT, uh, they wanted to find out uh, if we can provide sleeping berths like we have in trains, can we provide sleeping berths to uh, customers or uh, passengers in a flight? If you have a long haul flight, which is for on uh, from here to uh, some some uh, to one part of the uh, coast in US, the flight, you know, duration and if it's a single direct flight, you know, the course duration could be as long as, you know, 16, 17 hours. So uh, how can you, you know, provide a uh, sleeping experience to the customers? So then they simply, you know, instead of going and completely, you know, redesigning the aircraft and all that, they simply, you know, measured the dimensions of the aircraft and they created some dummy in their college lab. So they created uh, the same space in that space. Um, they said instead of, you know, having six people sit, they put six chairs, right? So instead of six people sit, can we have six people sleep in the same slot? Will the head be sufficient enough? And, you know, will everyone have the comfort to move around and all that stuff? And then they realized that, you know, if they do this arrangement, only five people can sleep or actually only four people can sleep. Even, even that four people will not be able to sleep comfortably, you know, in the space which is available. So it gives a quick validation that this solution is not workable. You might launch this product, but the customers may not be ultimately happy. Uh, and now you see a lot of flights have that pushback, you know, like the traditional seats, pushback seats and that sleeping arrangement. This was an alternative to that. And this was not meant for uh, the uh, business class. While that uh, relaxing reclining seat is meant for business class, this was a solution which was meant for the economy class. So they piloted this. The other way to pilot, you know, which many of us can also try out is, you know, if we want a new layout for our office or you want a new layout for your customer service uh, center uh, or your retail center, you know, you could uh, kind of, you know, create a paper model of how that layout will look like, what will happen in each place uh, in, and the store and then bring in some customers, you know, friendly customers. It could be, you know, customers who are very loyal to you or it could be your business partners, or it could be, you know, uh, at random, you recruit some customers and ask them uh, that you come and give us feedback and we'll give you some small gift and things like that. Uh, and then you ask them for the feedback of, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, they experience this kind of a layout, you know, what challenges they might face. A discussion like that can give a, a lot of insight uh, before we start, you know, creating a blueprint and uh, going to an architect and before we actually, you know, install everything and later realize, uh, no, this table should have actually not been here. That kind of stuff can be avoided if we use a design thinking framework. So if I put it in the form of a project, right, we talk about Six Sigma project, lean project and, and things like that, right? So if we want to put design thinking in the form of a, a project, uh, then these could be the logical steps. And this is the example of that, uh, keep the change from Bank of America. So the first phase will be about finding insights uh, from maybe one or two customers using that to paraphrase your problem and generalize for an entire segment. And then from there on brainstorm and uh, use the experts to find out what can we do to solve this problem. Identify few areas which you want to pilot or uh, create a prototype. And in this case, they used a cartoon video and they showed the cartoon video like the earlier one that I had shown some paper models and all. So here they used a cartoon video and which is a low cost, uh, low fidelity uh, prototype. And they tested with what, 1,600 testers. So this is where the power of design thinking comes in. The moment you use a low fidelity prototype, you are able to try out multiple solution at a low cost and faster. Uh, and then you actually go and, uh, you know, collect maximum sample size. You try to hit as many people as possible, as many users as possible. So this will give us the advantage of trying to know what uh, the feedback from the market is at a very early stage. Then that will be iterated, refined, and then the final product will be launched. If you see in uh, this case, uh, Bank of America not only provided those uh, small things in the product, but they also added one key thing saying that if you sign up for this program, whatever savings you are doing in the first three months, equal amount of that saving will be provided by the bank as a donation to you. So this is kind of a, you know, very encouraging program for a lot of people to sign up. So they wanted to find out, you know, what drives the human behavior uh, in spite of giving a, a product to the customers, they may or may not accept it. So what is the last mile marketing 
um, you know, uh, initiative that I should take to onboard the customers that also they were able to pilot and include. <clears throat> and we could take similar exam examples from hospitality, uh, uh, from hospital, hospitality, any other service industry. I know a lot of you are coming from the service industry of, uh, you know, servicing computers and, uh, and, and things like that. So, uh, defining the problem statement, how might we improve the uh, patient's experience and using low fidelity prototypes by mapping the journey of the customers and not necessarily mapping the touch points. Normally, what we do is we emphasize more on the touch points, which is to say, you know, there is a call center, there is a guy making a call and uh, there is a, a person from our uh, side attending the call. We focus on how well we can get that call right. We do training, we do a recording of the call, feedback, scoring. We do a lot of things there, right? But that's just one touch point with the customer. We should realize that the customer uh, is going through a journey in his life. So in this journey, we are part, we are playing a part, right? So how do we then make this journey smooth for the customers? That should be our objective. So our focus should be on mapping the journey of the customers rather than mapping the individual touch points and uh, exemplifying or making the touch points uh, very rigid uh, of high quality, high quality. That, that's not our objective. Make it flexible and focus on the entire journey. So some of the common design thinking tools is like, how do we define the customer personas? And for each persona, we, we create a journey map. Uh, for example, if your mother is going to sign up for uh, integrating her Aadhaar card into her PAN card, the process she will follow will be very different from the process you will follow. And it will be very different from the process your grandparents followed, uh, they had to follow, or the process your children will follow. Because each one of us have a different level of uh, adaptation to the environment, right? So then we need to define different types of personas. And for each persona, we create a journey map. And likewise, we have other tools. Uh, I talked about rapid prototyping, but there is a tool called empathy mapping. So uh, the concept of journey, I just want to spend a few minutes and then open up for discussion. The concept of journey mapping focuses largely on uh, you know, looking at the end-to-end -end process from the view of the customer instead of saying that, uh, and I'm talking about this journey mapping uh, extensively because this is one of the key tools. Uh, if you want to go back and say, how do I implement uh, design thinking in my uh, office? So the journey map could be one way to get started. So uh, you look at the whole process as a journey of the customer. So see it from the customer's viewpoint. And what is the customer doing in the case of uh, you know, any anything that he's buying uh, from you, right? He is searching for some solution for a problem that he is having. For example, somebody says, uh, I want to upgrade my car. Uh, he is upgrading his car for certain reason. He has certain genuine reasons for why he wants to upgrade a car. So he wants to find out which is the best car for that, right? And then he wants to find out other things about, you know, is this the right solution for me? He needs validation. He goes to social media to validate whether this is the right car, whether the feedback about the car is good. He asks his friends and other people he trusts. So that validation is the second phase. Then the process of, you know, buying the whole product. So there comes in, you know, uh, transparency, convenience, and, you know, personalization, all that stuff, right? Then usage and service, right? So there he expects a defect, defect free, um, you know, product and he expects self service in most of the cases. You know, he wants, uh, that he should be able to attend to most of the things by himself. Uh, you know, we uh, we don't want to go to the bank branch very often, right? So uh, if it's only a real concern, you want to go to the branch. Otherwise, you know, you want to do it on your mobile app or you want to do it on your uh, email, uh, you know, sorry, your uh, desktop application, right? Your banking. So self-service becomes one of the key drivers uh, in the usage space. And then finally, um, to derive more, what more can I do with the product? So if you map the journey from the viewpoint of the users by interacting with the users, by walking the journey through the user's eyes, uh, by uh, conducting interviews with the users, you may come to know that the journey that they are going through is very different. Uh, if for you to appreciate what I'm trying to say, assume that uh, you joined your current employer, the day when you joined your current employer or when the interview experience you had, the day you joined, after joining the onboarding experience and then the first month's salary and then, you know, 90 days after joining 
then your first performance appraisal, your first promotion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So if you look at this journey, what you went through, the emotions that you went through, the concerns you had, for example, uh, would have not been uh, the priority of your HR. Your HR might be seeing like uh, time to hire, how many open positions are uh, there in the system, how can I fill this position, uh, is this guy joining or not joining. They see the problem from a different perspective. And you as a prospective uh, employee, you are seeing the problem from a different perspective. So in design thinking, we appreciate the viewpoint of the customers. And uh, in uh, capturing the emotion of the customer, we could use a, a chart like this to say positive means good emotion, negative means bad emotion. So sometimes, you know, at each stage, when you're talking to customers, you know, you will clearly come to know a large proportion of the customers say, oh, this phase of, uh, you know, installing the equipment is a highly painful process. So their concerns are about installation. So that phase. Uh, is actually a negative emotion and not a positive emotion. So we could map the emotions of the customers uh, as we interact. And then you would find out that there are certain emotions which are extremely bad, uh, what we call as uh, the pain point, right? And there are certain emotions which are excellent. You know, the, the customers are having a warm moment uh, as, they are, as they are interacting with your uh, touch points. So these two, you know, we call them as the moment of magic or moment of misery right for a customer and these both define the moment of truth for the customers the moment of truth for the customer is that if you ultimately ask him to do a nps survey and he's going to rate you high or low it is based on that moment of truth that's what will come in the back of his mind when he is putting that rating like when you are going in a theme park right and if you want to take a snap of you uh, coming along with your friend and that moment you want to capture that emotion, uh, no phone can capture that emotion. Uh, because at that place, when you are coming down in the swing, you are actually inside the uh, that swing and your best, uh, you know, iPhone, whatever version you have uh, is not actually there to capture that. Uh, you want that emotion to be captured from a different perspective. So what the service providers do, the theme park guys put a camera there, it will automatically take a snap. And when you come out, they will say, sir, this snap is 500 rupees. Do you want to buy the snap? And you know, this snap, you can never click it anywhere in your life next time because it's a very candid photograph, right? So the example I gave this is because the moment of truth uh, is usually a very candid moment and uh, it is a very high emotion or a high negative emotion moment. And if we are able to identify it, it's a very important element in our journey to build our whole um, uh, loyalty with the customers. So I think I covered broadly what design thinking is. So I'm going to spend next uh, two to three minutes talking about, you know, what more you can do to learn about design thinking. And I want to talk about some of the prominent names in design thinking. So there is this gentleman by name, uh, David Kelly. So he is um, uh, founder of one of the design thinking uh, studios called as IDEO. And uh, he, as you see rightly, his uh, quote, that he emphasizes more on the empathy um, rather than focusing on the functional aspect. So there are a couple of, uh, you know, big uh, institutes or big names when it comes to design thinking. One of them is IDEO. The other is uh, IDS or uh, Institute of Design uh, in Stanford. Uh, then University of Virginia, Darden uh, School of Business. So these are some big names when it comes to design thinking. So you could go to their website. I'm sure there is literature to read about design thinking. And these are all some of the uh, common uh, books relating to design thinking. Uh, the book on, you know, change by design, you know, Tim Brown is a, a, a colleague of uh, Kelly. So that's also a very good book. The Tom Kelly's book itself is there, you know, Art of Innovation. Uh, so a couple of uh, interesting books, The Design of Everyday Things, you know, that's also a very interesting book. So these are all books that can give you a very broader perspective and open your eyes towards the world of design thinking. What I wanted to leave you with is an impression that design thinking is not necessarily for designers. It's not for product development alone. It's useful for service design. It's useful for problem solving. You can do it in HR if you want. You can do it in IT if you want. So it's a, a toolkit which you can use in your everyday life. Uh, this is in fact a book authored by me. 
uh, which is called as a client centric protagonist and here uh, in this book one of the chapters i have emphasized more on uh, the human to human value creation you know how we can uh, you know create value for our customers our employees uh, as we interact with them by focusing more on the emotional and inspirational aspect this book is available in amazon if you are interested it's a small book so uh, with that uh, i would like to you know come to the end of this discussion and open up for any question and answers Show. My yeah. Table first. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is good to actually see all these things. Uh, and, uh, the empathy that factor that is prime uh, for uh, uh, any design thinking. Uh, but right. my question is, yes, I am developing a product. Uh, it is good in lab, but when it has to come as a marketable prototype, there a design is required, right? It has to be complete. It should be just a working model or proof of concept. That completion, come to that kind of completion. Any ideas for that? See, first is, <clears throat> uh, as uh, the emphasis in design thinking is more on getting uh, a MVP product, right? So minimum viable product. And how can we use low fidelity prototypes to te test with the customers uh, whether that final product you're going to talk about is going to uh, be accepted or not in the market? That is the uh, emphasis of design thinking. So it it encourages you to uh, fail early. Uh, instead of uh, looking at it from a perspective of giving a full fledged, uh, you know, complete uh, complete look, uh, if you can give it a look of a uh, you know, a rudimentary, um, you know, prototype and uh, which actually encourages the creativity of the customers. It helps the customers to visualize what you're trying to provide. Uh, for example, if you're developing a software product, instead of actually writing the codes for the product, can you actually create the wireframe on, uh, let's say, a PPT or you create it on Canva or, uh, you know, any uh, any other tool? Uh, which is not functional in nature, but it provides the customer an opportunity to visualize how the end product will look like and how it will solve their problem. And then identifying their feedback from there, you know, that's the strength of design thinking. But uh, once, let's say, you know, you fine tuned the design and you got some insights, the remaining bit of trying to code that uh, insight you have got into the product and uh, executing it is pure execution, right? So if your prototype has been successful, but you are not able to replicate the features of the prototype in the final product, uh, then I think there is a problem with product development and uh, you know technical competency. Uh, you need to split here between technical competency and the design efficacy. If the problem is to do with design efficacy, then focus on what I uh, just mentioned about. If the problem is about technical competency that uh, on paper we are all giving a great stuff but when we want to implement it our guys are not able to get the final solution to the customer so then it means there is a technical competency related issue so you need to iron that out uh, differently using engineering approaches i yeah. hope this uh, answered your question yeah but uh, uh, you're right i am in that stage i have in the, all the uh, images to the customer but the thing is i i'm not in a position to actually do uh, a multiple iteration uh, once i have to complete a product i cannot go back and again uh, do the frame or anything so that is one one limitation that i have and uh, i'll take the point of yours sure sure See, one of the challenges we normally face in India, practical issues with the design thinking concept is, uh, with respect to India is that, um, firstly, you know, uh, India is growing at a very fast pace, right? So uh, people are generally restless that they will miss an opportunity. So quite often, you know, uh, from the top, there is a pressure to get things done fast. 
why are you deliberating so much on it get it done why do you want to keep asking the customer don't you know you know you are you are a customer yourself so see it from the customer's viewpoint and things like that so sometimes we try to short circuit and try to use a shortcut approach that's one the second thing is about uh, in design thinking we encourage uh, certain level of uncertainty uh, that is we want uh, you know not uh, everyone to answer all the questions uh, sometimes when we are asking people uh, why are you designing this uh, he should he should also be puzzled to say sir even i don't know why i am designing this so i will pilot it and i'll let you know right but unfortunately in our frame of uh, you know org structure and things like that uh, no one wants to tell their manager that i am uncertain about something uh, if if you give the impression that oh i don't know uh, frankly i want to figure it out myself then the boss will be saying are you the right guy for the job so there is a certain level of i think uh, cultural aspect to design thinking being successful so uh, that is also a uh, important factor that plays into the success of uh, applying design thinking uh, in different cultures i'm exactly in that spot now <laughs> uh, so uh, you need a change from the top so any other question Um, um, Mr. Neil uh, Rajkumar is saying, I just posted the question. I got um, somebody okay, from that. Okay, just sorry. a point of clarification. Uh, see, conventional uh, problems approaches uh, generally have a carry a negative tone with the primary focus on identifying root causes. In this context, uh, what I understood is in the DT, the methodology promotes a positive and solution oriented mindset. Am I right in saying that? Uh... Uh, no, I mean, see, you know, we still work with a problem only in writing the problem statement, but uh, our problem statement is more pruned and it is not necessarily uh, so rigid in terms of quantification. Typically, when we write a problem statement, uh, you know, we try to say, you know, so much is the revenue, the gap is so much in the last uh, six months. If we don't meet this revenue by the end of the year, we will end up incurring a loss of so much. Something like that is our problem statement. But in design thinking, um, we try to understand the problem a little more deeper and try to say that uh, our salespeople are not confident uh, in following up with the customers. Why is that problem occurring? So we try to actually you know, define the problem in a a completely different manner, but we still talk about only a problem and not always an opportunity. Thanks. There's one more question from Akila. Sorry, I missed the chat uh, after Rajkumar mentioned. I saw that. Uh, should design thinking be be on different lines for B two B and B two C? Uh, not necessarily. See, you know, I mean, uh, how you implement it might change a little bit. That is. Uh, uh, you know, when you're interacting with a B2C customer versus when you interact with a B2B customer, the setup and, and things like that, you know, has to be a little bit different. Like I I did a design workshop for a set of company, uh, you know, owners and I, CIOs uh, last week uh, on how generative AI can be used um, uh, in uh, manufacturing. So th these were, you know, uh, B2B customers, senior people, decision makers. So the way the workshop, the session was set up was a little different. Let's say the same thing I had to do for a retail uh, crowd, you know, a set of kids or uh, for that matter, you know, anybody else in the retail uh, framework. Uh, then the way we organize it and make it more uh, acceptable or amiable to the audience will be different. But uh, it will still have the same fundamental elements in terms of what design thinking is meant to do for you. 